Welcome to The Authority File, the academic library podcast from Choice. Choice is a publishing division of the ACRL and publisher of Choice Reviews and CC Advisor. This episode is brought to you by Credo. I'm Bill Mickey, the host of the podcast and the editorial director at Choice, and for this four-episode series, my guests and I will be discussing how collaboration and information literacy factor into the first-year experience. These discussions are part of a longer series on the first-year experience that Credo is presenting along with Choice. Next month, we'll look at some of the other components that help make a successful first-year experience program. But right now, for the episodes that follow, I'll be joined by Ray Pond, a doctoral student in educational leadership at California State University, Fresno, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff, Professor Coordinator for Information Literacy Services and Instruction in the University Library at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and Laura Cole, Director of Library Services at Bryant University. In this third episode of our four-part series, my guests and I take a strategic look at collaboration, why it's such an important part of first-year experience programming, and how libraries can build sustainable models going forward. All right, so we've touched on um, the idea of, of collaborating with a variety of different stakeholders, um, you know, in, in sort of first-year experience um, uh, programming and, and projects and, and development. Um, but I want to use this episode to really dive a little bit deeper um, or actually, um, I should say, take a broader view of it. Um, and, and talk about collaboration as a key component of first year experience programming and development. Um, you know, what, what, <laughs> this might sound like an obvious question, but what makes it so important? Um, how does it benefit libraries? And what are some of the reasons libraries rely on collaboration as a supporting part uh, of their first year experience efforts? And um, Ray, I'll just, I'll throw that to you first. Yeah, sure. I, I, uh think, like you said, everybody is doing some form of collaboration right. internally, externally. And I think uh, for the library working closely with outside stakeholders, it really means really building those relationships systematically, uh, communicating those values and really dismantling the stereotype that the library is siloed, just focusing on certain support systems, resources, and really bringing that credibility and that clout. And meaning that how do we demonstrate our values more than just um, saying that we have all these resources, but making change and influencing without the quote unquote authority, right? Mm -hmm. Because the library is, is, is in its own separate, separate area that isn't necessarily closely tied with student affairs or residency or um, parts of academic affairs necessarily. But it's also like, how do we um, work together and ensure that the, the uh, partnerships and the collaborations really support um, students um, and their needs for retention, for success? How do we make it inclusive? How do we make our spaces more um, open and really welcoming? And the library in itself, um, obviously, we can do a lot of assessments, like we've discussed on information literacy and, and so forth. But and demonstrating those values, but really looking at holistically the library's role as being a key component, key collaborator in building support and enabling these kinds of um, opportunities and projects for faculty to support students or directly supporting students. So that's sort of like my um, thoughts on this. And maybe uh, Laura, Lisa might have some other ideas as well. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what Ray just talked about here is is really key, and I think a lot here about collaboration and what it is that fosters collaboration, which I'm going to hearken back for a second here to the whole notion of being present. Mm -hmm. But I also think one thing that's um, you know undervalued sometimes is really listening to what people are trying to achieve. And asking those questions, you know, more about, well, what are you wanting students to do as opposed to, well, what can the library do? And so being focused on the users in that way, I think, can put us in a more strategic position to build those relationships. Right. Laura, would you agree with that? I would. Um, and I would say for us, um, one of the things that we sort of look at as being this um, 
kind of middle ground for student affairs, for academic affairs. We sort of walk this fine line for all of those different areas. And so we can be that place for students where, um, you know, they can come and they can get academic assistance and that sort of thing. But we're also a third place for them on campus. And we're also um, a place that might have we have, like we loan board games you know it's something as simple as that and like getting that message out there so for for the people then who, in student affairs who support those students being able to see like oh the library isn't just books and scholarly articles like the library has these other um real true um invested um you know interest in student life and and student success in you know in all of its forms um on campus excellent yeah you know i'm curious what you folks might think, um, you know, as you, you speak with colleagues or you do research on this or conduct surveys or, or whatever you do, um, um, do you feel like li academic libraries, there are still, you know, attitudinally, I guess, that they, um, some still need to understand that they, that that collaboration they need to be more proactive about it or, you know, they're not just sitting there as, you know, if we build it, they will come kind of attitude. I mean, is, is there still a general sense or even a um, somewhat general sense among um, libraries that they need to be building these relationships or do you feel like they've already uh, jumped that hurdle and they're now kind of figuring out how to build those relationships? Yeah, I I'll just jump in first here. I think building the relationship is a iterative and ongoing process. I don't think it kind of ends once you have a relationship. People mm -hmm. leave their positions, people change, and that really changes the and evolves the relationship in itself, meaning that it could go into different directions, totally different. And in terms of relating to policy, so if the library is interested in creating new policies supporting first-year students specifically, it, it obviously needs input from faculty. and. Yeah. If, if that changes itself, the relationship needs to be there for, for, for that to be successful. And I've been hearing, um, and this is something I actually had wanted to chime in earlier about open access, that um, I, I've been hearing from a lot of other folks in different libraries saying that they're having trouble, um, or some of them are actually being more successful in getting the open access policy for their um, faculty, like an academic senate getting it passed through, that there is a, an open access policy in their institutions. And I think it's because that is determining based on the relationship that they have already. And what what I think is it's important is that building those relationships um, isn't just having meetings. It's really, you have to be, like you had said, Bill, like being proactive, like going yeah. out there and uh, meeting with folks and really um, he, and listening to what their concerns are, but also knowing that there is sort of a um, uh, an, an open agenda, right? We're not building relationships because we want to have certain things pass, but we're doing this because we want to support each other in a mutual, uh, beneficial way. Are your first year students great researchers? Let's be honest, the answer is probably no. Websites like Google and Wikipedia have spoiled users with convenience while flooding the information landscape with sources ranging from shoddy to outright duplicitous. Credo Online Reference Service can help. Its user-friendly interface gives students the convenience they expect, paired with the authoritative content librarians demand. Features like topic pages, the mind map, and real-time reference make it ideal for demoing the research process during instruction. Visit corp.credoreference.com for more details and to download the interactive Credo FYE guide, Practices for Enhancing Instruction, which features prominent librarians offering step-by-step -step activity plans and best practices. Conceptually, I guess, first-year experience programming and, and student success sound like such simple ideas, um, but really... You know, they're, they're common goals that everyone across the institution shares, right? So, um, but at the same time, first year experience and, and, and the collaborative efforts for all involved are very complicated to execute. Um, I'm wondering if the three of you could kind of help us understand what makes this so complex. You know, what, what are the typical hurdles? And, um, you know, Ray, I'll just go back to you since we were just on this a little bit. Yeah, that's, this is a, a really, uh, a challenging question because it, it it's 
sort of made of different other parts and, uh, you know, we, our time is limited. So I'll say that <laughs> <laughs> student success is, is, is generally a, a, a really complicated term because I, I actually don't see it as too much of a simple idea because it's yeah. sort of embedded this this whole neoliberal context like we need to retain and cons consistently support change our ways our policies to you know really have our students uh, retain and stay in the course and be successful and that in itself comes in so many variables so many challenges mm -hmm. but um, from my experience working in two different uh, campus-wide committees at, at Fresno State before I, I I focused uh, for first year experience program focused more on ways to execute engagement activities. How do we mm -hmm. partner with different stakeholders like health and wellness, career development center, and then bring more students in to understand that there are all these new services coming from both partners. And student success, I've worked on a campus wide um, committee where we had our charge to create a uh, a four year plan, strategic plan, and it's similar to what uh, Laura had mentioned in Bryant University, creating e-portfolio, doing a lot of assessments, specifically targeting the first year seminar, which I think um, in our context has been sort of um, nebulous, like nobody seems to know like how to, re how to really um, support and define retention through that course. And so that, that committee was focused on that. And I feel like um, it, it's still... Uh, unclear, right? How do we like look into these two areas because th they have different uh, intentions based on the people who are on those committees and based on the charges themselves. So mm -hmm. that's sort of my experience and response to that. Okay. Lisa, anything you want to add there? I think the other thing I'd add to that is that in my experience, people were who are working with first year student programs are very, very interested in student success. And so it can feel like the stakes are high. Yeah. And so there's a um, there's a commitment and a passion there and which is great. Um, but sometimes that can also just it can be overwhelming because you know they're first year students for like three months. I mean for a whole year. But you know it's a it's a moment in time and that time passes very quickly. And so I think there's a pressure there that we feel that is a little different than maybe those activities that we might do later on in a student's college career. Right. Um, because that importance of getting students started, um, laying a really strong foundation, you only get one shot at that. Mm -hmm. Laura, do you feel that pressure with, with the programming you're doing there, Brian? Yeah, I would say yes and no. I mean, we have... Um, we have pretty good access as far as um, us getting to the students and be able, being able to message things as far as um, information literacy goes and, and getting some buy-in from faculty and that sort of thing. At the same time, I would say when, um, when we first switched over to this particular curriculum where we had student success components sort of moved in throughout the course, there was some, and, and with these, with the learning outcomes, um, you know, there were definitely some courses and some folks who were like, I don't have time to have, even if they were doing information literacy and they just weren't saying it explicitly, it was like almost like a, you know, I, do I have time to, to say it explicitly and get that messaging out there? And so I would say that's sort of a place where a hurdle will pop up now mm -hmm. and then. And so, so staying on top of, you know, consistent, positive messaging about like, hey, you're already doing these kinds of things. Let's add some context to it. Um, and so that, that's probably a place where we would see, um, you know, that pressure coming in. Okay. So there's a, there's a long list of opportunities here to collaborate with a, any number of um, groups or committees or individuals and in, in the library's community. And I'm wondering if, if you might give us some advice on uh, how libraries can, you know, um, avoid analysis paralysis, I guess, and, and begin to formalize a strategy that organizes their collaborative efforts, um, maybe prioritizes who they should be um, putting the top of the list in terms of, of partnerships and how they be, can, you know, more formally begin to lay that groundwork for, um, you know, a programmatic approach to, to collaboration. Um, and, and Laura, why don't we, we stick with you for this one? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that for us, it was really about who are people 
that we already sort of have strong collaborations with that we have kind of connections with. So it might have been something as simple as, um, you know, we have subject liaisons that go and work with particular departments. And so who are the strong um, faculty relationships that are, you know, where are the strong faculty relationships that already exist there? And then getting to know um, what projects are sort of being worked on. So it doesn't sound very strategic in some sort of formalized (laughs) way, (laughs) um, but it is in a like where, how can we sort of make headway. And then, you know, if, if I'm working with sociology and and they're talking about a particular university initiative and one of my colleagues is working with history and they're talking about another initiative, can we start to drop each other's names, plan some kind of meeting, and then really start from, um, you know, doing things in that sort of grassroots kind of way. That's really, um, you know, where we began from. And I would say, I, I still feel like is, is such an important way to sort of do things. And then, but then once you get past that, um, you know, you you get to sort of those administrative levels and they start to see that, um, you know, that's really where you can see things happening at a more university priority level. And, and, um, and, and again, bringing back Lisa's word presence, getting to have some more of that presence on those kinds of committees and things. We just heard from Ray Pond, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff, and Laura Cole. This concludes the third of our four part series on how collaboration and information literacy factor into the first year experience. This episode was brought to you by Credo. Be sure to join us for our final episode in this series where my guests and I get tactical and talk about specific ways libraries can promote collaboration and build partnerships with student groups, teaching faculty, and a range of other stakeholders in the library community. When I collaborate with folks, for instance, I'm, I'm mostly in public service. So that's where information literacy, first year experience, outreach, et cetera, research services and reference will be located. And I find ways to work with colleagues in special collections. Find all of the episodes of The Authority File on your favorite podcast app or on our website, choice360.org. Just click on the librarianship dropdown. On choice360.org, you'll also find information on Choice's entire product platform, including Choice Reviews, CC Advisor, Choice Webinars, resources for college libraries, our white papers, and a whole lot more. A great way to keep up with the Authority File is to join the Choice Authority File Facebook group, which you can access via the Choice Reviews Facebook page. As a member of the group, you can give us feedback, suggest podcast participants, chat with other listeners, and submit new topic ideas. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. 